you, Juanita. I really appreciate it. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here with Akasi and to have all of you on the line today. Um, I've had the pleasure, pleasure of speaking to going on 11,000 nonprofit leaders now in the last five years across Canada, and it's a real pleasure to be here with Akasi. I've worked with several uh, organizations helping new immigrants, and what a great job you do. And I know it's an amazing job, but also a very difficult job, and it can be uh, something that you need passionate people to work on, but also can bring up a lot of risk. Well, let me just tell you, remind you, the five webinars that we're going to be covering in this series. Today, I'm talking about risk management, an introduction to risk management. The next, and then we'll have a Q&A session. Today, we'll have some Q&A, but then we'll have a full Q&A session next week. The email will come out tomorrow with all the dates. Then comes the second webinar around screening volunteers and paid staff. And then again, we'll have a time to do an open Q&A session. The third webinar is around risk-proofing volunteers and paid staff after they join. And then again, we have a session where you can bring your questions. Then we have a webinar on managing your financial risk. And that will be with a financial ex expert uh, coming in to deal with that, Eric Plato. And, and then finally, our fifth webinar is on governance risk and how to create an engaged, effective nonprofit board. And I think you'll find it very, very uh, good. I had the pleasure of doing this with every kind of nonprofit across the country from United Ways um, and sessions where you have you know, 50 different nonprofits in the room to organizations where I do this just for them. Um, most of my weekends are spent with uh, uh, boards and my weekdays are spent with staff. So uh, it's a, a real privilege and all I do is work with nonprofits and charities. So it's, uh, it's my focus. Now just to give a little background on me, uh, for over 10 years I worked training insurance people uh, for two of the largest insurance companies. So insurance is my background. But then in 2007 I started working uh, only with nonprofits and charities um, with a center where we provided governance, leadership, and risk management help to, as I mentioned, uh, over 10,000 leaders in the five-year period. So now it's coming close to 11,000 and it's uh, been a real privilege. So yes, I'm wearing an Ar Argyle sweater today and I, the reason I pointed out is I would never wear anything this ridiculous normally, but uh, when I went in my closet this morning, that's what was there. So uh, I apologize for the picture on the screen. It's not the picture I would choose. It, it looks like uh, somebody who thinks that they know a lot more than everyone else. The, the hands crossed there, and uh, that's a picture that was chosen. And uh, <laughs> so there you go. I don't normally <laughs> look like that. Um, so I hope today you're going to be feel very very comfortable uh, ask, uh, asking questions. Now, for some of you who are on the line uh, in the minutes before we started the webinar, uh, I was talking about how we have the new technology where uh, if you sign in and you've got a headset with a microphone. Uh, we'll be able to actually talk, uh, actually hear your voice when you have questions. Um, so going forward, uh, many of you don't have um, a headset with a microphone today. So if you don't have a headset with a microphone, please type your questions or comments in the question box. And, and then we'll be able to get to your questions. We normally, in the last series, because the microphones, uh, that wasn't available with technology. We just left the questions for the last half hour of the session. And if there wasn't questions, I would just like speak through for the whole hour and a half. Um, now that we do have the technology where if you have a microphone, you can actually uh, put your hand up and you can see a hand icon uh, in your box. If you put your hand up, Petra is here. Petra, say hi, by the way, so they can hear you. There's Petra. You can hear in the back. Petra is great. So she'll be looking. If you put your hand up, and she, it may take her a little while to notice because she has to scroll through all the names. If you put your hand up uh, with a question or comment, then we'll come to you and actually open up your microphone, and at that point, we'll be able to talk. Right now, we can't hear any of you because you're, uh, all of you are muted. So if you have a question and you have a microphone, raise your hand. If you have a question or comment and you don't have a microphone, then just type it in the question box. So that's where we'll go. And then going forward with the other webinars, I hope you'll come back and uh, have a headset that plugs in with a microphone. What you do is you go to Staples or you go to Walmart and you can buy a, mic uh, a headset that plugs in to your USB in your computer. So uh, buy one that plugs in with a USB, so not a normal headset. Plugs into your USB and it'll have a microphone on it. And uh, so if you don't have one already, it costs about $40 at Staples or Walmart um, or other stores that you might find in your communities. So again, thank you for coming today. My name is David Hartley, and it's a real privilege to be here. Um, and I hope that we'll have a, a good time today. 
uh, it, you know, it's risk management, but we try to have fun. Um, and these are Yolanta's feet. Should I just know that? Is it possible? Uh, probably not. So here's a uh, risk management done poorly, a warning sign. Children left unattended will be sold to the circus. Uh, don't worry, serious points are coming. But I love this. I have two seven-year-olds, identical twins, and uh, Jack and Jonah. And probably most of you on the line, you've got you've got kids or grandkids or or family members with kids. And uh, so this is just a reminder that although we might be doing some serious material today, I hope you're smiling. Uh, just love this picture. Another great kid picture. These are two kids, by the way. No, he didn't lose his head. Uh, tired, tired child somewhere. Bless her heart. All right. Uh, what do you say? The little baby is not upset. Kids are amazing. So three goals with these five Okasi webinars. Number one, help you find practical ways to find and manage your key risks. And I'll talk today about how critical this is. If you're a board member, if you're a volunteer manager, if you're executive director, whatever your role is, uh, senior staff role, uh, there's senior volunteer role certainly. I speak with organizations that have very few staff speak with, and sometimes that have no staff uh, or one staff and then organizations that have 500 staff. Regardless, you need to figure out with what we do and the programs we run, what are the key risks that we face? It's not just so you can stay out of a lawsuit. Um, I, I never focus on lawsuits. Uh, there's, when we did the study up till two summers ago and looked at the lawsuits in Canada, against charities and nonprofits, we only found 106 lawsuits that reached a judge in a 10-year period against charities and nonprofits in all of Canada for a 10-year period, 106. Now, if you look at that, say 10% of lawsuits reach a judge, the rest are settled out of court or thrown out. It may represent only 10% of all lawsuits, but still, 106 in a 10-year period, even if you times that by 10, it would be 1,000 lawsuits in a 10-year period, 100 lawsuits per year, you know, we're estimating, that is a very low number compared to other jurisdictions. And it to, compared to the United States, we are not becoming like the United States and Canada when it comes to lawsuits against charities and nonprofits. We just don't see the numbers. We don't see the type of lawsuits that they face in the United States. We really are a safe place to run a charity or nonprofit if you have some basic things in place. And that's what I really want to help you as a charity or a nonprofit today uh, look at in terms of what are the key risks? What do we need to put in place? It's not going to just help you stay out of trouble. It's going to help you have a better functioning uh, organization, an organization that has stronger uh, programs in place as well. So number one, help you find practical ways to find and manage your risks. Number two, help you engage your people. So whatever policies or tools you put in place actually work. And when we do the sessions in between the sessions, I'm going to go over a checklist with you. Some other things that don't happen during these webinars, you'll get more in those community practice sessions, which tomorrow you'll get an email in terms of when they're going to be happening. And yes, I want to try to make this engaging and fun. So. Uh, we can see during webinars, I can kind of get a feeling, we never tell anybody this, but I'm just going to tell you, when you're doing webinars, obviously I imagine most of you are also uh, looking at other things, you're looking at emails and so on. One of the things that uh, people who are running webinars can see is they can see how many people actually have the PowerPoint screen on in front of them or whether they flip to another screen. So I've always kind of looked at that and see whether or not the webinar is going well based upon how many people actually have the screen that I have in front of me as their screen. So uh, now, if I was you, I would be looking at an email and doing those other things, so don't worry. I'm not going to pinpoint you or start calling out names, but I, I do look at that to see whether or not it's actually working for you, um, given the fact that I do know you've got other, other things going on. So those are the three goals of the sessions. Let's look at some risk areas. Well, there's a lot of risk areas. Here's a list of 11. Uh, there's financial, so what crisis could result from fundraising, banking, investments, loans, uh, compensation, financial activities, actual or alleged mistreatment of a vulnerable client, certainly new immigrants, regardless of other things, most of them in that first period of time when they get into the country, they are all vulnerable, uh, regardless of whether they're a child, whether they're disabled in some way, or whether they're elderly. Accidents during regular special programs transportation-related accidents, uh, food poisoning, uh, internet 
issues. So if you provide internet uh, at your sites or uh, in terms of people posting pictures on their Facebook or so on from an event to viewers. Um, workplace violence harassment in Ontario, we call it Bill 168. And if you want to know more about that, you can just Google Ontario Bill 168. And you can actually see what the government's posted in terms of policies that you can put up. If you have more than five staff, you need to put them up yeah, somewhere that everyone can see them. I recommend in a kitchen area or something like that. If you have less than five staff, you don't need to post them, but you should still take a look at it. Both posting the violence policy and the harassment policy, which you can actually see online. Natural disasters, severe weather for some people, depending where they, they live, it can be bigger issues. Key staff loss. So losing someone to illness, uh, God forbid, or death, or they just leave the organization. Uh, it's a big risk area. Uh, let me point out too, because this is not a complete list, if I was adding to this, um, and by the way, you should have received all the documents by email earlier, Petra emailed them, so you can see this PowerPoint, you've got a copy of it, you also got a copy of the two other documents that we sent. But I just want to point out that if you want to add to this, another key, key risk is hiring the wrong person. Um, how many of you, and you've all, if, I, if we'll just open up the, um, the you can see it here. You can see you have a place to put your hand up. How many of you have ever hired the wrong person for any role? Just put your hand up. Let me see how many of you put your hand up. How many of you have ever hired the wrong person at any time during your career for the wrong role? So I can see a bunch of hands go up there. You know, it's a critical risk. You hire the wrong person and you could be stuck for years uh, with somebody who can be toxic for the organization. What a huge risk. So I often counsel organization to fire people that you truly cannot re rehabilitate and so to, to you know get an employment lawyer to make sure you do everything properly but get rid of the, the person that's a toxic person in the workplace so not not somebody that you've tried to rehabilitate or you haven't tried to rehabilitate but somebody you really have tried and um, yesterday I was doing a session on conflict management and how important it is to be able to handle conflict and as a leader, you know, they say for executive directors, 75% of our time is spent on managing people. It doesn't leave a lot of time for strategic planning. It doesn't leave a lot of time for dealing with your board. It doesn't leave a lot of time for other things. So managing people is so critical. We'll talk about that in future webinars. So key staff loss um, is also due to a topic that I do want to spend a few moments on. And I'll just go to the next slide here. And that is burnout. Burnout is a big issue. I just want to spend a few minutes on this. Uh, regardless of the talk, uh, topic I'm talking about, whether I'm in Vancouver and Yellowknife and Yukon, PEI or in Ontario, I'd like to spend a few minutes, no matter what we're talking about, on this issue of are we watching ourselves or our senior people in our organization? So whether you've got five staff or you've got 500 staff, are you keeping an eye on yourself as an executive director? Because nobody's watching you. They call an executive director of a nonprofit charity the loneliest job in the country, and I think it's totally true. One of the big issues is you're watching your people. Your board uh, should be watching you to be, be sure that you're not burning out, but often they don't see that as their role. So when I do governance training, I tell the board members, please keep an eye on the executive director. Keep an eye on the most senior person. Make sure they don't burn out. So it's often entirely overlooked. It's just exhausted people. And in charities and nonprofits, we have this as an issue across the board. And we need to keep an eye out for it. Now exhaustion, I just some pictures of what exhaustion looks like. This is a, a car that's in trouble. You know, you wonder how in the world would he ever think, it's gotta be a guy because there's no woman in the world that would do this in my opinion, but uh, how would he ever think that this car could handle that type of load? And yet we do this, with nonprofit managers and our top people all the time. Find people who are really good at handling a load and give them more and more and more and more. And what a critical risk burnout is across the country. I have a conference that I did every year. Uh, I, I meet nonprofit leaders probably as much as any other person in Canada. And I'll tell you, burnout is across the board. This is a, this is a massive issue. So please keep an eye on yourself. Keep an eye on the, on the leaders around you and ask them, can you, are, have we given you too much of a load? Are you burning out? 
So here is uh, Dr. Swenson, who's a ph phenomenal in this area, came up with this graph. And before, it, it kind of doesn't look that exciting, but let me explain it to you. Uh, stress is on the bottom, productivity is on the left-hand side. Stress is actually good. Um, a lot of us need stress to get work done, you know, in the sense that deadlines help and so on. And you can see at the beginning, stress is, helps you be more productive, more and more productive, until you get to point A. When stress gets to a level where your productivity starts to slow down and even drop, because you, fatigue sets in. Now, at, at a certain point, at, that's at point B, things get critical. Not are you fi only fatigued, you're exhausted. Now, how many of you in the last year, just raise your hands if this is true. And by the way, nobody else can see your hand raised except for me. Uh, literally, nobody can. Uh, raise your hands if in the last year you've had a period of exhaustion. Put your hand up if that's the case. Okay, most people on the line, most people on the line, two-thirds of the people on the line, at least from what I can see, have put their hand up. Okay, and this is normal. Periods of exhaustion are normal. What's not normal is to continue to live there. If you continue to live there, you'll see your productivity drop and drop and drop until you see people that really cannot function properly. And by the way, amazing Sharp, sharp people are the, are the people that generally fall in this category. It's people that are pushing and pushing and pushing. So whether you're doing it to yourself or you're doing it to the leaders around you, it can be very, very dangerous. And it is a critical risk. So uh, this is a whole training in itself. And, you know, in the future, I would love to, to uh, do some more training on this issue of burnout. But let me just give a couple points. You cannot manage time. Time is going to go past. You know, since we started talking, 21 minutes have passed. I can't manage it. In another minute, a minute will be gone. I can't do anything about it, but I can manage my life. So high-quality life has much more to do with removing things from your life than adding to them. So Steve Jobs, he said efficiency is, is not adding or saying yes. It's saying no to more things. So I just want to point out a thing. If you want to have a piece of paper next to if you have a piece of paper, you can just jot a couple things. Might you consider during this webinar jotting down uh, uh, some things that are part of your day or part of your week that are really sucking the life out of you, the energy out of you, really burning you out. Um, are there some things? Make a, a list of them and start to figure out, okay, is there someone else I can pass this off to? Or is it something that I shouldn't even be doing or nobody should be doing? It's not part of the mission of organization. Uh, that's an important part. Another thing, um, check your body. And that means, you know, if you, are you having... Uh, doctors will say two things, cardiovascular and gastrointestinal. So are you having heart issues or heart pain, chest pain, or are you having stomach pain, issues with your stomach? Those are two things. And just to point out, uh, if it's in your body, that's the last place for stress to show up. Uh, you have people that are calling in sick, uh, especially you senior people, and it's starting to be more, it's happening more than before. Don't just assume it's issues outside the office. It may be things that are related to their work. So take it very, very seriously. So there's a ton of ideas here, uh, but one thing you might consider is I'm only going to check new voicemails and emails two times a day. That's a really great idea. I'm going to wake up, arrive at work, do lunch, leave work, go to sleep at the same time. Um, McLean's, if you saw it in January, they had this great list of the five things we, we don't realize that we're doing that are killing us. Well, <clears throat> one of the things is that going to bed and waking up at the same time the body's striving for that, but the body also wants to eat breakfast, have lunch, and, and have dinner at the same time. The doctor who wrote that was a doctor for Steve Jobs, the top oncologist in the planet. It says that our body is looking for that um, the similarity. So going to sleep, waking up at the same time. So you might have people that are going to sleep at 12, waking up at 5, but their body somehow has become used to that. that that's crazy, 5 hours, but some people be able to, seem to be able to do it. But regularity is what the body's after. Number three, and by the way, don't tune out on me here because this is critical. Um, actually, somebody's got their hand up, Ifat, and let's just see. I'll open up the phone. Ifat, do you have a question there? You can go ahead and talk. Ifat, or Ifat's had, uh, I'm going to type in a question. Ifat's saying he can't hear us, sorry. Um, Ifat will t take a look into that. Uh, if you can, uh, in your question box, give us your phone number, Ifat, and we will uh, we'll call you and try to sort that out. Can you put up your hand, by the way, anyone else? 
uh, if you're having difficulty hearing me right now. Put up your hand. Okay, no one else. Okay, great. So if I, just send us uh, uh, your phone number or we'll give you a call. Okay, so uh, go to the doctor for annual physical and test. Please listen to me on this one. Uh, how many of you, put up your hand, you've been to the doctor for an annual physical in the last year? Put up your hand, if you don't mind. If you don't want to say you can't. Okay, keep going, put, keep putting up your hands. Everyone except for, so I'd say 80% of you put up your hands. For the other 20% of you, please go to the doctor. My dad was a medical doctor who helped people for a living, and he didn't go to the doctor, and I saw him die of, of colon cancer, and, a, and it was just a horrendous disease thing to go through. So, you know, if you're over 45, 50 years old, get a colonoscopy. Matter of fact, email me, let me know you did it, and I'll send you a book just because I'm so proud of people and they actually do it. But go and get your, to your doctor once a year. Why am I talking about that in risk management? Because I see way too many nonprofit leaders across the country, and I'm talking thousands of people, who simply, as they're managing the organization, forget to manage themselves because they're so busy helping people. They end up, and my dad is a great example of that. So it's a passion for me. Move during the day. Um, even as you're listening to me right now, uh, Petra, show me, Petra's going to move your feet for me. There we go. Petra's moving her feet. I'm moving my feet. I'm standing up. I'm moving around. I'm doing circles. But find a way to move during the day. And at, at lunchtime, uh, get out, go for a walk, uh, and let your staff see you. If you're a volunteer manager, let the volunteers see you um, in terms of, let them see you uh, moving around. Um, let them see you taking lunch off and not working at your desk during lunch. Then they're going to figure that they're going to have to do that. Now, I realize that nonprofit charities don't have enough staff and they're overburdened. The vast majority of them, and I see these people, I meet them and I see the tiredness in their eyes. But the reality is, is we're going to be way more efficient if we do some basic things. So, you know, get up and walk during the day at lunchtime. Go out for a walk. Don't eat at your desk at lunchtime, which is going to show all your other staff that they need to do that. One other thing, uh, I take pain seriously, I put there. One other thing, in terms of leadership, I love doing leadership training, but, you know, walk around. Let your staff and your volunteers see you and walk slowly. I love that as a great leadership line. When you walk around your office, walk slowly so that you stop and you say hello. They can't do it all the time. Um, but, you know, let people see that you, you care about them and that, that in the busyness of life that you take, you take uh, uh, meeting them, understanding people very, very seriously. Anyways, that's burnout. There's a lot more we could talk about, but that's a really critical thing. All right, so let me move on. Uh, here's some slides that come from nonprofitrisk.org, which is a great organization in the United States, um, and so a couple slides from them. Uh, the seven deadly sins of risk management for nonprofits. Number one, stepping over the banana peel. What that means is people in the organization, volunteers, volunteer managers, staff, managers, executive director, you see something wrong, but you go, oh, I hope somebody else will take care of that. There's no lights in the parking lot. They burnt out. I hope somebody noticed it. Well, you know, I could tell you in terms of volunteer retention, which is always a big issue with nonprofits, Volunteers leave often for issues that nobody found out. So one quick thing here, if you want, if you're jotting notes down on the side, make sure you have an exit interview with every volunteer or staff that's going to leave. If you can at all do that, find out why they're leaving. Number one, here's another thing: stay interviews. We'll talk about it later. A stay interview means for your key people that you really can never afford to lose. Do a stay interview once a year. And what's that? It means they're staying, they're not leaving, but you want to see how's it going? Is there anything that can be done to improve the work environment for them? Is there anything that they need? It's, it's doing a, an interview with the people that you really need to stay. So there's exit interviews, there's stay interviews. Um, by the way, if you go Google exit interviews or stay interviews, you'll find some great information. Number two, assuming others have your nonprofit's interest at heart. No matter who you're working with or no matter who your clients are, you have to, I don't want to be jaded, but the reality is that you can never assume that because you're a charity or a nonprofit that, you know, nobody would ever sue you. There would never be, nobody would ever uh, consider causing you problems. If you've been in the nonprofit world long enough, you know that there are people that, uh, especially in times of crisis, can become very difficult. Number three, a, a deadly sin, operate as if insurance will take care of the risk. Well, I'll be talking about insurance uh, in one of, 
one of our sessions together. That's my background. I believe in having good insurance. But just insurance on its own is a real miss, and I'll talk about that later. Signing a contract you haven't read, never do it, especially big contracts. If it's a lease agreement with you're leasing a property or uh, uh, an agreement for a piece of equipment that you're leasing, anything on a large scale, you want to make sure you have somebody who really knows contracts uh, who can read them. Acting as a screen staff or volunteers will do no harm. The reality is, is that we have to be vigilant um, in terms of, especially when we're working with clients that are vulnerable. I'll talk about that in detail. Worrying without taking action. If something's keeping you up at night, write it down and tell somebody. Get it started. And then, of course, number seven, the seventh sin is not getting started at all. That means so many nonprofit leaders, and there may be some of you on the line today where you go, wow. Uh, after this session, think there's so many things that I got to think about. Well, the issue is, what can you start with? And my last question today is, what are you going to, what can you do in the next 30 days? So instead of thinking, okay, there's 50 things that we got to do, and we're, you know, we've barely started. What is it that's something that we can do? Or on the other end, if your organization has got great policies, um, sometimes I get to an organization, I take, ask them to take a look at their their volunteer management guide or their employment uh, policies or any other material that they're providing their staff and volunteers, and the, and the binders are so thick, the material is so thick that nobody could ever be expected to understand it. So in that case, we're getting them started on thinning down their materials. And I suggest that every risk management policy can be written on one page of paper or less. The normal 12-point font, not like a 3-point font, uh, one side or the, the back side of a piece of paper, just one piece of paper. So I really like organizations slimming down. So I guess the point where volunteers, we hand them three or four pieces of paper, that's it. Here's the things they need to remember. And anybody could be expected to know those three or four pieces of paper. Here's seven things you should be doing. By the way, if you have a comment or question during the session, please type it in the question box, and we're, we're watching the question box. Um, otherwise, we'll, uh, I'll ask you if you've got questions at the end of the session. Um, but please, if you've got a comment or question, type it in the question box. I'll stop the presentation and look at the questions that you've got. So seven things you should be doing. Make policies clear, concise, consistent, and let me add one more C word that's not actually spelled with C, and that's kind. So make every policy kind, really clear so everybody can understand it, concise so short, and consistent, meaning we're gonna, we have the same policy for everybody. We don't have a policy for people that are special, executive director's own child becomes a volunteer, oh, they're the executive director's child. No, it doesn't matter. We hire people the same way. We fire them the same way. We're clear, concise, consistent, if you can add the word kind. Every single waiver that I've written with an organization, we always start off every document that we write for volunteers or staff, thank you for being our staff member. Thank you for being our volunteer. Now, for the reputation of the organization and to protect you, we ask that you do or don't do the following things. So thank you. I think every document that goes to volunteers or staff members should start with a sentence that, sa that thanks them for doing what they do. Ask or invite the tough questions. That means, as an executive director, as a volunteer manager, that I really do have an open door policy, meaning if you see something that we're not doing that you think we should be doing or doing something we shouldn't be doing, please come in and, and let us know. Now, you may want to tell people what, when you give us something that we need to improve, also give us an idea. So don't just come in with a problem, come in with a solution. Um, someone just a, a sent a question saying, David, do you have a sample of volunteer risk policy that you can share? Absolutely. So when we get to volunteer risk management, uh, the session on, on, on that, they come to that session and we're going to go through it. And actually, um, what I'll do is for the question period for this one, so if you come back to the question period for this session, I'll bring a, I'll bring a, uh, a policy on that. Just so you know, we have a, our next webinar is screening volunteers and paid staff, and the third one's risk-proofing volunteers and paid staff after they join. So those sessions, I'll get more into that, but thank you for that question. Um, that was from Rose. Thank you, Rose. So, <clears throat> so ask and invite the tough questions, and, and that's very important. Uh, I know we're busy, and the last time you, the thing you want to do sometimes is, is have people walking in your door and, and uh, or if you don't have a door, and I know some leaders don't, they just have a cubicle or whatever it is that you have. You think, I'm already so busy, I don't need more issues. Here's what I suggest. This is very, very important. I hope you listen to this, because uh, I know some of you are multitasking right now, which is great, and I would do it too. Listen to this. Have a section of your day, if you've got a door, that you close your door. 
and everyone knows that period of time of day, whatever it is, it could be lunchtime, it could be a period of time where you shut off for 20 minutes, 15 minutes, and and you go to a place that's going to be calming for you. So for me, I love sports, so I might close the door and look at a sports website for 10 minutes. Just do something other than work, right? So I want to unplug for 10 or 15 minutes, go for a walk, right? Where people know that there's a period of time where you're inaccessible, except for emergencies, of course, right? I work with uh, organizations all the time, victim services, some immigrant organizations where people do feel like they always have to be available. And the truth is people should know there are times that you're not available except for emergency. Other than that, though, we want people to know that they can come and talk to us. And how are you going to know whether or not you're good at that? How many people are actually coming in the door and asking you questions? Do you have people coming with new ideas? That's wonderful because we're not just trying to stop bad things from happening. We're trying to make sure we don't miss any good ideas. Who has the good ideas? Often it's the staff and volunteers around us. Um, the second question came in. Uh, thank you. And this is from Catherine. Uh, do you have a checklist of all the policies that we should have in place? Boy, that would be amazing if I did. Um, I work with literally hundreds of different organizations. There isn't one you know, a checklist for every type of organization. If I'm working with a youth-serving organization, that's going to be a different list than I'm working with a senior-serving organization, right? But yes, when we get into the question and answer periods between, I am going to give you checklists uh, that I think um, are valuable and go through some items. Even today in the session, I'm going to give you some things that you should make sure to look at. I'm going to go today through a risk map so you can figure out what your risks are. Once we know what your risks are, we can figure out which checklist we should be using, if that makes sense. So. We'll talk about the bare bones today. In the session between uh, next week when we do the, we dive deeper, I will go into checklists. So I know um, that checklists are an important issue. Um, the reality, though, is uh, if you're doing a special event, I've got a checklist for that. If you're working um, with young people that are vulnerable, you know we have a checklist in terms of the screening that you ought to be doing. However, the reality is, is that one big checklist uh, that's available for all nonprofits. It doesn't exist. Um, in Australia, where they've tried to do that, when the government's tried to do that working with its nonprofits, they've narrowed it down for different types of nonprofits. But you know, we have, um, I think, 12 different categories of nonprofits in Canada. And so social services would be one. But social services is hugely broad. So a checklist for everyone is almost impossible. So when I'm working with United Ways, or wherever I'm working with an organization, it, it, uh, it is a question that comes up, oh, comes up and all the time. And when I say, okay, let's start with a risk map as we're doing today, and then we'll dive deeper. So great question. Another question, how would you motivate staff to train volunteers to do the tasks they need help with? So how would you motivate staff to train volunteers to do the tasks they need help with? Wow. So this is around the burnout issue, I think. And thank you. That question was from, uh, is it Lubna? Um, Lubna, thank you for that. Um, Getting staff to allow volunteers to do work, sometimes it's a difficulty depending on the culture of the organization, where an organization truly believes that, you know, the volunteers don't know enough, so it has to be staff, or we, um, or we haven't screened the volunteers prop properly or appropriately, so we can't get volunteers to do it. Um, you know, we're getting away from uh, the, the staff doing everything model to now sharing a lot of tasks across the country. A lot of organizations are, and it's really where we should be going. And the term volunteers even um, is becoming a word that maybe we can change to another, to another word, and I'll talk about more of that when we get into the volunteers. But the term that I like is external talent. Isn't that a great word? So a volunteer could be changed with the term external talent. Uh, I know that came from a volunteer in Vancouver. Uh, and the idea being is that w there's volunteers that have really ver very, very uh, amazing skills. So they might be amazing in social network, for instance, a young volunteer who knows Facebook, who knows Twitter and all those things that some of us, including myself, it's not an area I would enjoy working in. So, you know, can we use the talent of volunteers? Well, how do we get staff to, to encourage them or motivate them to do that? I'll talk about that more when we get into future webinars, but let me just say this at this stage. Uh, we need to encourage staff that if they don't use volunteers, they may find themselves vol uh, burning out, number one. Number two, they might find themselves trying to uh, improve skills in themselves that, that will take a long time to do when the, the skills are around us. So we should be recruiting volunteers and asking volunteers, hey, what kind of skills do you have? 
Uh, and you'd be amazed at the kind of things volunteers have. I'm always amazed at the skills that are in a volunteer group, things you never expected. Um, you know, they might have some real wisdom in marketing. They might have some real wisdom in creating a PowerPoint. They might have some amazing wisdom in, in, in the contacts that they have in the community. Um, so they may be able to find us external talent. People will work for free for two hours a month on, on whatever it is that you're doing. So, so motivate them by saying, look, um, I know we've tasked you with a particular area. We're not tasking you that you have to do everything. If you can, you can use the people around you, fantastic. Um, so uh, think of volunteers as external talents. Great question. Thank you for that, Lubna. We'll get more into that as we go on. So uh, try the simple approach first. That's the third virtue. Um, it's a big issue, and especially with organizations that tell me all the time, we don't have money. Um, well, you know, most of the risk management that I'll be talking about over these five sessions uh, are things that are free and they are easy to do. Um, there's some things where we do need to get a lawyer, but most of the things we can do on our own. Um, some things where you need to get insurance. If you ever serve alcohol at any special event, fundraiser during the year, you know, there's some things I got to put in place. There's a checklist for that for certain. Um, there is insurance you need to put in place for that event. Even if you're holding it at a hotel and somebody else is serving the alcohol, the reality is you're, you're still up and you're still liable. So, you know, there's, some, there's a situation where we're going to need some skill, and you can always email me if you're holding an event where you're serving alcohol, and I'll tell you what things you need to put in place. But try the simple approach first, and that, that means who do we have with us right now? Um, who do we already have as a volunteer, as a staff member? Uh, what skills do we already have? What, what documents do we already have? Put people first. When it comes to risk management, I don't like to think about saving ourselves from legal liability. I like to think of about it for protecting people. Good risk management is protecting people, number one. Number two, protecting our reputation. If you protect people and you protect your reputation, don't worry. You will protect your legal liability. Learn from experience. That means if something goes wrong, document it. And I'll recommend you do a risk map every two years and look at the risk. The only way you'll know what things are going on is if somebody is documenting. What stuff went wrong? What stuff almost went wrong? Anticipate the future. Seek help. You know, if you need help, seek for it. I mean, Ocasio's here. There's other organizations that can provide help to you. Ask for it. You know, um, I'm certainly giving my my email. Uh, you got it there, David Andrew Hartley at gmail.com. David Andrew Hartley at gmail.com, and we're I'm very glad to be of assistance to you or point you to someone who can assist. Or point to a website or checklist or um, as you go through it. So. By the way, these dates are the, the old dates of our five webinars, so it looks like this slide was the old slide, but so disregard the dates, obviously, but those are the five webinars that we'll be doing, and today is the first. Okay, so this, the starting place, when I look at risk, and we've certainly started already, but risk is absolutely normal. Um, risk with your volunteers, risk with your staff, risk with your finances, risk with your governance, your board, uh, but it's all about finding a finding the risk, prioritizing them, involving your own people. Now I'll talk to you about how you can do that. Let me just uh, point to some documents here. Thank you for the questions, so keep come, ha having them come in, and I'll stop as we, uh, as we go through the presentation. Let's just flip to the document that I sent to you, or sorry, that Petra sent to you, called Risk Management Buying Into It. So if you could just flip over, so I'm not looking at the PowerPoint right now. I'm looking at the document called Risk Management Buying Into It. So this is a document that I wrote for Imagine Canada for five years. I worked as the director uh, over there of the Insurance and Liability Resource Center where we helped organizations manage risk, nonprofits and charities. Um, so that you see the website that's on the top of there. and There is some good resources. Um, so if you flip through it, that document, Risk Management Buying Into It, you can see there uh, what risk is, um, what risk management is, what the obstacles are, to risk management, and that's a really good document, um, and I wrote that several years ago, but it's a, uh, hopefully you'll find it very valuable. Let me just look at the, at the obstacles on page three. Obstacle number four. So I'm in the other document. I'm not looking at the PowerPoint right now. I'm looking at the other document that Petra sent you earlier today called Risk Management Buying Into It. <clears throat> Obstacle number four. We don't have the skill or knowledge to do, to do this. So I see, you know, smaller nonprofits, um, you know, and they, they think, you know what, we just don't have the staff. We don't have the volunteers to manage this. And I say, well, you know what, um, that's what I'm here for. 
So I'm providing my email address to you again, David Andrew Hartley at gmail.com. Um, and you know, email me anytime. It will never cost you a dime. Um, and sometimes I won't be able to get back to you right away because I'm I'm traveling a lot and I'm doing a lot of things. But uh, I I always endeavor to answer emails within 48 business hours. Um, sometimes I'll answer you at two in the morning, but I'll do my very best. So, and also there's the material that we're sending out here too. Um, then there's Ocasio and others that can help you. Obstacle three, we're fine. So you have organizations where they just say, you know what, I don't need this stuff. We've got lots of policies, um, and, or you know what, we're just too busy. And there's a quote there from the, the uh, captain of the Titanic. I cannot imagine any condition which could cause a ship to flounder. I cannot conceive of any vital disaster happening to this vessel. And of course, you know, the Titanic sunk. And, you know, humility is needed to be a great nonprofit leader. And you also need great courage. Uh, so you need to have this humility where you, and this, this silent recognition that anything could go wrong at any time. But the reality is, is you can't be worried about everything all the time. What you need to figure out is what are the key risks that I need to be worried about and what can I put in place? And that's what I'm talking about today. Obstacle two, they say, well, you know what? We've got insurance. We're fine. Well, the reality is, and I've got a, a little slide up here. Where did I put it? This slide here, if you look back to the PowerPoint here, when you look at your assets as an organization, your assets are your reputation, your people, your building, your contents, your stuff, and then your money, your revenue. And what's intriguing is that almost everybody across the country recognizes that your reputation, your people are your two greatest assets. And guess what? Those are the two things you can never buy insurance for. So um, there is reputational insurance in the States right now. Maybe it's going to come here to Canada where they'll fly in a, a consultant after a crisis and they'll try to salvage your reputation. But the, rep the idea is they, they, can't, they can't promise to do that. You can get insurance to cover your building, your, your assets, uh, your, sorry, your contents, your stuff. You can get insurance to cover money that's stolen or all kinds of other issues around money. But you cannot get insurance for reputation of people. So risk management is the way to go. So just going back to the, to the other PDF there, that, um, just if you can go back there. So that's obstacle two. Insurance is not enough. You need to have insurance, but that's not, it, not all of it. Obstacle one, we don't have the time or resources. I mean, in a nutshell, this is what people say. What I say is, well, let's stop thinking of risk management as risk management. Think of it as good management. When you figure out what things could trip you up and, and manage those risks, it's great. It's good management. It helps you go to sleep at night. That's why I called the website um, nonprofit-triplez.ca when we built it for five years. Nonprofit-triplez.ca, helping nonprofit leaders sleep better. Having good risk management in place will help you sleep better. So look there at obstacle number one. We don't have the time or resources. Um, and at the third paragraph there, the center that I ran at the time, the Insurance Liability Resource Center, we believe that every nonprofit organization, no matter how large or small, whether it runs one event a year or several events a day, whether it's one staff member or a thousand, should have as its first priority to protect its people. So here's, let me just give you a side fact. I have all kinds of organizations I work with, like yours, who help people day after day after day. Their mission is to, use, through many, many programs, help people. And, and often in doing that, and being focused on their clients, they protect, for, forget to protect their own staff, their own volunteers. So it's a big miss. I can give you stories now that, you know, if you had a, a good heart in you, you'd be, the tears would just be flowing. It happens across the board. And so just remember, as you're focused on clients, which is such a big duty. I mean, Canadian organizations, they've been focused on clients for decades. What I'm trying to get them to, to think about is, as you focus on clients, don't forget to focus on your own staff and volunteers. Matter of fact, let me tell you something. If you want to keep the best staff and the best volunteers, let them know that they are a greater priority to you than your own clients. Now that's heresy for some charities and nonprofits, but I believe it. I thoroughly believe that your staff and your volunteers should be a greater priority to you than your clients. Okay. I then go in the document through the 14 uh, benefits of risk management. There's some great stuff in there around legal liability and even around uh, lawsuits and what happens during a lawsuit. Let me just jump to number 14. So on page 7 of the, of the document that uh, Petra sent out earlier, number 14, risk management can be a valid defense in a lawsuit even if your volunteer or employee doesn't follow your policy. So, 
the great thing about creating risk management policy, and by the way, I don't think you should create policy for every possible bad thing that could go on in your organization. It's absolutely impossible for you to do that. You'd have binders and binders full of policies. But the, uh, the most important thing is to figure out what policies do we need that are going to cover our, our great big uh, risks, and that's what I want you to focus on. But let's say you do have a policy in place, and on one particular day, your volunteer or staff member doesn't follow it, and you got sued. Now, will your policy have any value, given the fact that they didn't follow your policy? And the answer is yes. Your policy can be a will be a defense and and very likely a valid defense in a lawsuit so it's not just when people follow your policies that they protect you the policy protect you even when your staff and volunteers don't follow them because you can show that look we had we had these six critical things we knew were risk areas we created policies around these six critical areas our volunteer staff member we trained them they knew about them but they didn't follow them so yes, they would be in trouble, but as an organization, you would be okay in a lawsuit. So risk management policy around your critical areas is very, very important. There's a question that came in and said, do you think there's a risk if a client is also a volunteer at the same time? Well, sure. Uh, we see this happen uh, all the time where somebody um, was a client and they now become a volunteer. My, my preference is to... Um, have, you know, if I had the choice, let me make that clear, if I had the choice, my preference would be to have people that were clients now volunteering, that they're not clients at the same time. So um, possibly what you could do is type me a question, give me the scenario. Is it somebody, why are they currently a client? Um, maybe give me more of a scenario. That was uh, Rose, thank you for that question. So Rose, maybe give me more of a scenario that I can work with. My preference would be to have somebody that was a client. I love that because they know the issues that new immigrants face or they know whatever it is, the program that you're doing, they know the issues that are faced and they're able to become phenomenal volunteers. So it's a great group to draw volunteers from. If they are currently a, a volunteer and they're currently a client, I guess I'd like to know the scenario of why that is uh, because that certainly brings a lot more risk. Um, but I can see it working. It just depends on the scenario. So maybe you can give me more of the scenario. Uh, by the way, was Rose somebody that had, Rose, if your microphone, uh, if you have a microphone, and I remember we tested earlier, you can just put your hand up, and I can open, yeah, great, uh, and let's open up the microphone. So, Rose, go ahead. Okay, can you hear me, David? I can hear you. Okay, so if a client is currently enrolled in... Can you talk a little bit louder, just your, or turn up your volume on your microphone? I don't even know where my microphone is on the Okay, computer. talk as close as you can to the computer then. Okay, can you hear me better now? That's a little better. Just talk louder. Okay. So if a client is enrolled in a self-help program, for example, and then they see area where they can help out within the program, so they start. So tell me what kind of t tell me Rose what kind of self-help program this is. Uh, say it's a program where they do arts and crafts. Yes. And then while the client be involved in the program, thinking, oh, I can teach other things uh, to other clients as well. So okay, what I kind of, what, that, well, arts and crafts, it would be no problem there uh, at all unless they were working one-on-one. -on -one. I'm mm -hmm. assuming the program would always have supervision? Uh, that would be a staff on-site, yes. Yes, on-site or always with them? Uh, with them, yeah. Okay, with if they're with them, I see no problem. But other than arts and crafts, what sort of things might they volunteer in? Uh, they could be doing some kind of physical activity, like Tai Chi or yoga and things like that. Okay, but again, their staff is always with them? Uh, yes. Right. I, I don't see a problem with that at all. I think it's wonderful. Okay. I mean, the bottom line is I'd like to have an interview with them ahead of time. Um, you know, I might even do a little reference checking. I'll talk more when we get to screening in the screening session. But, Rose, my, my thinking is we ought to do more and more of this because it saves uh, uh, resources, all kinds of things. But I just would like to know about the person a little more. The fact that there's a staff person with them, it takes care of this issue of, uh, you know, vulnerable people there uh, or if they start trying to do financial counseling or they, they go outside of the area we want them to help with. So as long as the staff person is with them, that's great. I may still want to do some screening in terms of reference checking and so on, so I, I find out that somebody is, is loopy, that I, they seem fine to me, but I've hardly ever known, I haven't known them very well. Now that we give them a chance to stand in front of people, I'd like to know a little more about them. The more they've been a client, we've spent, you know, dozens of hours uh, with them, we know them really well, that, that I have no problem. Does that answer it, Rose? Uh, yeah. Thanks, Rose. 
Thank you. Um, another question come in? No, okay, so keep the questions coming in. And if you do have a microphone, put your hand up and then we'll come and see if we can actually get the, the call right on the line. So Rose, I'm definitely gonna go more into what screening should be done and what types of people uh, and when we get to the screening webinar and I'll go through exactly what I think we need to be doing and we'll get into details. So, um, but thank you for the question. Okay, <clears throat> so back to the PowerPoint here. <clears throat> Um, so there's a lot of material there that I've given in the others, uh, the, the handouts that Petra sent earlier, but let's go back here. The greatest risk, uh, and we've got another half an hour in our session, I will end right at 12 and we'll answer questions as they come in, is organizations that don't take good risks because of unfounded fear. So I hope you don't leave this session and you go, wow, I, I'm more afraid than when I came. I hope you leave here and you, and you heard, heard me say, Ontario is a great place it's a great place to take important risks to help it people that otherwise wouldn't get help. But we need to be very smart about it. Uh, you know, we have no laws in Ontario that protect nonprofits or charities, not a single one. So if something goes wrong, someone slips and falls on your, at your organization or at an event and you get sued, you'll stand in front of a judge exactly as if somebody slipped and fell at a Swiss Chalet, at a McDonald's, at a Home Depot. There's no laws at all that help in Ontario charities and nonprofits. If you go to Nova Scotia, we got a, a Volunteer Protection Act that protects volunteers, not the nonprofits, but the volunteers. Love to have that in Ontario. That protects volunteers from getting sued. We don't have that in Ontario. If you, in other provinces, um, in Saskatchewan, we've got certain help for board members of nonprofits. Ontario, we've got nothing. But the good news is there's very, very few lawsuits. And if you take some smart, um, um, make some smart decisions, as I'm going to point out through these five webinars, some very few things that you can put into place. You can go to sleep at night and feel very, very good. So, you know, if, if you're going to be afraid of something, always look for the data. So adaptive fear is fear that looks at risk realistically. Toxic fear is fear that leaders get because they, you know, have you got a person, maybe you're, I taught my mom how to use a computer. She's in her 70s and finally taught her how to use a computer. Well, you know now, I'm getting emails from her all the time of all the things I should be afraid of. Maybe you've seen emails that come across the email. You know, don't use a cell phone. Uh, it's going to explode. Uh, don't have a cell phone. You know, uh, I, I mean, things that are, that are absolutely ridiculous because it happened one time, right? You'll see uh, with the Boy Scouts or the Scouts in the UK, you know, if you're a scout, you got the chance to eventually, if you've gone through enough uh, of different stages, you would get a knife, a knife that could be used for carving wood and so, uh, so on. But they were going to get rid of the knives because of one person that was afraid that of one incident uh, where someone got hurt using a knife. Well, we're going to take away the knives from everyone. Well, that's ridiculous. The reality is, is that when they looked into the data, the knives were very safe and the kids loved them. They loved going through all those basket weaving type of activities until so they finally got something cool. Wow. Now I finally, after being in Scouts for so long, I get a knife. We go, I can, I can whittle wood and I can do some cool things. And of course they train safety around it. Um, toxic fear would get rid of everything risky. You'd never do anything of true value that help people in vulnerable situations. Vulnerable people are risky to work with. New immigrants are risky to work with. There's no question about it. How many things could go wrong? How long do you have time? I can start telling you about uh, the things that could go wrong. But the reality is, let's not look at what could go wrong. Let's look at what has gone wrong. So when we get together in the sessions between these sessions, I'm going to ask people on the line to tell me, tell us what's going on, what things have gone wrong, and we'll try to manage risk that is real, not just fairy tale risk, right? So I work with big brothers, big sisters. Can you think of anything more risky than, than matching up a vulnerable little boy with a man. How many of you put up your hand if you think that is a crazy risk? Matching a vulnerable little boy with a man. Well, I put my hand up. That is about as risky, I can see hands going up there. To me, that's one of the greatest risks in the country. I've got two little boys. You know, should I pass away? And I would want men to be in their life. And they've determined that they should match up vulnerable boys with men. How many people put up your hand if you agree with this statement? Women would be safer to mentor little boys than men. Put up your hand. Come on, be honest. How many of you would agree women would be safer to, to match up with little boys? Only three of you put up your hands. Are you? Well, I put up my hand. I think women are far safer. The data shows 
that women are much safer when it comes to sexual abuse, the vast majority of it's done by men. But why, don't, why haven't they just decided then that we should match up little boys and little girls always with women? Because they've determined that little boys need the mentoring of men. I didn't decide that. They decided that. And the program has become very successful. And by putting in proper screening measures, they've now been able to get the allegations of, of abuse against boys um, down to, I mean, it's just negligible. And, and to the point that, uh, that you could be very, very safe putting your kids in a Big Brothers Big Sisters program. Um, I certainly would want to check as a parent and so on with all the things they do. But, but you can do a great job. So you can do very risky things as a nonprofit. The most risky things, but things that you know need to happen by putting in place good adaptive risk management. Okay, it's all about organized sense, right? There are times when you'll need to bring a client in, but let me just say this. Use your people as much as possible. Great book called The Wisdom of Crowds by the New Yorker columnist James Sirwicky. He looked at this idea of why is it in our culture that we're so fixated on bringing in consultants every time we have a problem? Well, the reality is when they looked at it, large groups of people are smarter then a few, a few number of people. Now, I'm shooting myself in the foot here because I'm a consultant for nonprofits. But I'm telling you, if you got together a large group of people that are your volunteers and your staff, they'd come up with a way better answer than I could give you. I know it's true. When I come into a charity and I'm there to consult, the very first thing I do is gather people together and do one-on-one -on -one interviews, and I figure out what, not only what the problem is, but what the solution is. Now, sometimes I have to you know, use some wisdom I've gained outside of that organization, and, and hopefully I bring some extra perspective. But the reality is most solutions can come from your own people. We had another question or comment. Um, yeah, so someone made a comment about the Big Brothers Big Sisters and said, it's possibly safer that women would be safer than mentoring um, um, by men, but boys need a man in their lives, absolutely. The reality is, is that they've determined, Big Brothers Big Sisters, that little boys that don't have a dad in their life, or for whatever reasons they don't have a man in their life, they need to be mentored by a man, that they need a man in their lives. It, it, the reality is it would be safer. It would very likely be safer if we mentored all little boys by mentoring them with women. But they wouldn't get the, the man they need in their lives, and that's what Big Brothers Big Sisters determined. Now, that's just the best example I can give of how nonprofit and charities sometimes have to do things that are riskier because the program's needed, desperately needed, and I know that happens in New programs all the time. I've worked and done training with the host program um, uh, through Catholic Immigration Services and so on. So I've had my, uh, and certainly answered hundreds of questions from uh, programs where they're helping new immigrants. So leaders need to lead. This is my next slide here. Ask hard questions. Admit mistakes. You know what your staff and volunteers, volunteers need to see? They need to see on occasion you saying, let me tell you a, a mistake I made in the past. Or let me tell you a mistake I made last week. Uh, you can't do that too much or they think, wow, I've got a leader who just does nothing but make mistakes. But let them see the humility because if you do that, they will admit mistakes. So um, just be willing to admit mistakes, you know. Um, it, it's not, it doesn't make you less of a leader. It makes you a stronger leader, you know. Um, I like this comment made by Roseanne Barr talking about a, a good leader. You know, Roseanne Barr, if you remember, how many of you remember Roseanne Barr? She had a comedy show. Put up your hand if you remember. Some of you are young on the line and you won't remember. Thank you, thank you. Some of you are more my age and older. I'm 45. I don't know what uh, age we have on the line, but and you're probably not going to tell me, are you? <laughs> but Rose Ambar had a show, and she said about leaders, she said, good leaders are north of a slob, north of a slob, S-L-O-B, and south of a snob, S-N-O-B. So good leaders are north of a slob, south of a snob, meaning they get to work on time. They show people what it's like to be a good worker. They don't just tell people to get training, they get training themselves. But they're also south of a snob, meaning they've got that humility. They care about their staff. They, they occasionally admit when they've done something wrong. It allows staff and volunteers to say, you know what, um, I'm going through a difficult divorce right now, and I just need this next month, I may be irritable, you know, this is where staff can come to you and say things like that or tell you, you know, uh, some, some things about their program or issues where they made mistakes, um, situations where there's a volunteer that's become very tricky, and they can be very open and honest with you. Okay, so that's ask hard questions, admit mistakes, respond to new ideas, have a balance between 
knowing your mission, rowing, and safety, right? All right, so you want to create a culture of candor where people can just talk, right? That, um, you don't want a place where it's secrecy and people are whispering in, or, or just saying, that's not my job, so I'm not going to get involved, where they're just covering their butts, basically, right? Um, you want openness. You want people coming in with ideas. You want people, you know, like the gentleman in this picture, as an executive director, as a volunteer manager, I want you, them knowing, you know, uh, I mean, I'm not here as your personal counselor to deal with your, your family issues, but when it comes to our work, I am here to talk to anybody, anyone, about anything. And, and that's really critical. You think, you know, I'm very busy. Well, I know it. I'm tired as a leader. I know you are. But let me tell you, if, if you allow people to come in and maybe uh, tell you something that's going wrong or a, or a staff issue or a volunteer issue, it might be the situation that's going to save you from much bigger problems down the line because you had no idea that that issue was going on. Also tell people when you come in, bring a solution. Bring two solutions. Um, we may not go with it, but I want you coming in the door with a, with a solution. Well, um, we've got about 25 minutes. I'm going to talk through a couple other things. Let's talk about legality. Oh, we've got a, a question that's come in. Or Shane's put, or Shay's put her uh, hand up. And Shay, go ahead and talk. Or Shay, if, you, if, you're, if you've got a microphone, go ahead and we're listening. Okay, or Shay, maybe uh, you can type your question in the question box. I think the uh, microphone is not working. Go ahead, type your comment or question, in the, and we'll go, go from there. So let me get uh, uh, you into the second document. Uh, Petra, earlier today, uh, emailed you two documents along with the PowerPoint. And let me just jump to that. So it's tab two and it was emailed to you, it's called Risk Management, the Process. And if you can just open that, I'm not going to show it on my screen. Um, I've got another separate computer here, that's why it's not there. But if you open it up and look to, I believe it's page 10. Let's go together and find it. It's page 10. So it's key legal concepts. So let me just talk about that for a second. So it's page 10 of the second PDF that Petra sent to you earlier today. Let me just talk to you about some key legal t um, things that you need to know. Well, first of all, liability. Liability is dealing with uh, ob obligations, responsibilities you have. So is, when someone sues you, there's only three ways that you can lose a lawsuit. And this is you personally. Um, it's for for-profits and it's for non-profits and charities. Now here they are. So look at page 10 of the second PDF that was sent out. So it's liability and negligence. Number one, you break a law. Obviously, if you as an organization break a law, you can lose a lawsuit. So it's important that you tell staff members, you know, if you break the law, if you punch someone in the face because you're mad at them, well, you're going to put, a, put us in a very difficult position. So we cannot be breaking the law. You can't, you know, harass people. Um, you can't be violent against someone, like I mentioned. Um, now, should somebody punch someone, and I'm aware of a situation with a nonprofit you would all know, where a volunteer had finally one day had it with a client they were working with. The client was a noxious soul. The volunteer was doing, uh, um, I think, three times a, me a week. They met with them and helped them, had done so much. And one day, this client just was so rude that the volunteer, on a bad day, just slugged the client. And if you knew the situation, um, you might feel a little bit gracious towards this volunteer because this client was a horrendous, horrendous individual, at least in this situation. Well, um, the client sued and they sued the nonprofit and they sued the client. Well, you know, it, obviously the, uh, the client sued the volunteer and the nonprofit. Obviously the volunteer is in trouble because they've bro broken the law. Now, would the nonprofit be in danger there? Well, they're certainly going to get named in the lawsuit. But I, I don't anticipate that the nonprofit will, um, you know, be na uh, sorry, lose that lawsuit. There's nothing that they had done. Uh, they had done proper screening of the VIN individual and that volunteer and client. There's a lot of extenuating circumstances. I think the nonprofit's fine, but the volunteer is certainly going to be in trouble. Um, whether they lose money, they're certainly going to um, um, be in trouble with the with the with the law. So breaking the law is one way you can lose a lawsuit. Most nonprofit and charities, this is extremely rare. I very rarely hear of this. Um, you could have a board member or a staff member uh, steal or uh, you know, 
commit some sort of crime, certainly, but it happens very rare. What you do sometimes see is nonprofits that are breaking their own bylaws. And you know breaking your own bylaws as a board, um, that is breaking the law because the bylaws are the law. So I just remind that. So breaking the law, number one. Number two, breaching a contract. Every time you sign a contract, you're going to have to keep the contract. So before you sign a contract, make sure that you know what's in it, number one. Number two, that if it's a difficult thing to read, that you get somebody who knows how to read contracts to, to read it first. Uh, if you're in Ontario, there's an organization called Pro Bono Law that provides free legal help to nonprofits. Uh, it can take a while to get their help, but Pro Bono Law, and that, that's one way you can do it when you don't have the funds. So number one, break a law. Number two, breach a contract. Number three, the, the last one, is to be negligent. And here it defines what negligence is. So negligence is not doing what a reasonable organization uh, should do, whether you did it intentionally or unintentionally. And that's, of course, why we have insurance, is exactly for this. If you're negligent and, or you, uh, you know, breach a contract or someone says you, you broke the law, that's why we have insurance. But you can lose a lawsuit for these three things. So we want to make sure that we're not negligent, we, that we're always doing what's reasonable. And by the way, reasonable is the most important term. If you're going to write, write down one word from today's session when it comes to risk management, your goal is to know your key risks, number one, and number two, to manage them reasonably. So if you have got, if you're working in programs where there's young kids or some people that are very vulnerable, right? They're not just new immigrants, which certainly are a vulnerable population, but they're kids or the elderly or someone who's disabled in some way, some capacity. You've got extra care you've got to take there, right? We want to make sure not to be unreasonable in managing the programs dealing with the most vulnerable, right? So those are the three ways you can lose a lawsuit. That's liability and negligence. The next one, vicarious liability. Oh, there's a question? Oh, somebody, by the way, put up their hand to say that uh, they knew Roseanne Barr. So look at that. Somebody on the line. Well, that's fantastic. Uh, here's a question from somebody on the line. Would an abusive client be able to sue an organization for denying service? It's a great question. Well, um, when we when we have the session after this uh, next week, when we go into more detail, I'd love if you came and you brought more of the scenario. But um, anybody is able to sue an organization for anything. I think your question is, could you lose the lawsuit? So first of all, anybody can sue for anything. My guess is that um, you know half of lawsuits are frivolous and they get dropped. Nothing ever happens to them. The court throws them out. But would they be able to win a lawsuit? Well, they, you, they would have to prove that, number one, you've broken a law. Number two, you breached a contract. Or number three, you'd be negligent. In order to win a lawsuit, that they'd have to, to prove that. Well, the question is, is um, in terms of uh, not allowing abusive cl a client to be part of your services, as long as you document it carefully, then no, I don't think there's any possibility that you could lose a lawsuit. Would you have to prove it in court? Possibly. Would the court probably just throw it out? Almost certainly. So bottom line is document, document, document. Um, when things happen with clients and they're abusive, make a record of it. Talk to the volunteers or staff who dealt with it. Get their quotes. Put down the date and time. When did it happen? What happened? Who was involved? What, how were they abusive? And then warn the client. Document that you warned them. You know? Now, if it's so abusive, then you know, one warning might be enough and just say, look, that's it. But if it's a minor level of abuse, uh, in other words, they, they swore or you know, the, the kind of minor level, low level, then you might want to warn them and say, look, we've got three strikes and you're out policy here. We've warned you once. Two more warnings and you're gone. So I would have a policy on dealing with abusive clients. And then I want to document exactly you know, who the person was, what the situation was, and warn them along the way, just like I would warn volunteers or like I would warn staff members. I, I have a policy. Now, here's the deal. Whether it's a staff member, a volunteer, or a client, if anybody is really egregious, you know, over the top situation happens. I don't wait for three strikes. I get rid of them then. And go through a lawyer, certainly with staff involved, a staff member. If you're going to get rid of a staff member, I've had staff do some really egregious things. Uh, a staff member, let's say, who had a sexual relationship with a client. I'm not waiting for a th third strike. They're gone now. And even if I hadn't created a policy around it, and there might be a chance I might get in trouble, 
um, because they might come back and, and sue for wrongful dismissal. You know, I'm going to get an employment lawyer and walk through the steps. Um, really, really disgusting behavior does not need to be tolerated from staff, volunteers, or clients. Another question? No? Okay. Great. So, so that's uh, the next point I want to bring up is vicarious liability. Whether you can see this in the documents um, there, but let me just tell you the the most important point around vicarious liability. You can read a lot of detail in there. We've got 16 minutes left. Um, you know what? I'm just going to point out <clears throat> that you can you know see the, the the detail there. But the key is this: when you allow volunteers and staff member to go out and do programs for you, it's e even if they're not wearing a uniform, and they probably aren't. It's as if they were wearing a uniform. So let's say it's an, um, you know, a program for new immigrants, whatever it is, and they are going to someone's home just by themselves. The fact that you allowed them to go there, sent them there, means that you're vicariously liable, meaning you didn't tell them to, to do something wrong. Let's say that a volunteer or a staff member went there and they stole something from the, from the client, and the client was to sue. Well, you're thinking, well, how could we get in trouble for that? Well, if you hadn't done proper screening, you very much could end up losing the lawsuit too. So when I get into proper screening in the future webinars, you want to pay very much attention to situations where you're allowing people to be one-on-one -on -one with clients, which is a big, big issue. So vicarious liability means do proper training. Do proper screening, especially for very uh, vulnerable clients and when the programs are going to be, you know, one-on-one uh, uh, -on -one or any sort of dangerous types of programs. The first question I always ask is, you know, is there at least two people present? You know, it's a big, big issue. So vicarious liability means, remember, when people are out there doing good stuff on your behalf, even if they're driving to the bank on your behalf, whatever they're doing, they are carrying your name with them. And joint and several liability just means that you may not think there's much money in the bank as your organization. Um, let's, you know, in Ontario, the average or 55% of Ontario's uh, 45,000 incorporated nonprofits, 55% of Ontario's 45,000 incorporated nonprofits have a budget of $100,000 or less. So if you have a budget over 100,000, and I deal with organizations that have less than that and multiplied times in the millions, if you get higher than that, the bottom line is if you're in a lawsuit and you're one organization named in a lawsuit, out of 20 organizations, but none of the other organizations have any money, you can end up footing the whole bill. So I, I mentioned these three things to board members to say, look, do a risk map, which I'm going to talk to you about in a second. Take special care of managing your liability, even though I know that Ontario is a very safe place to be. The reality is we have no special laws protecting us. There are plenty of situations when you work with vulnerable people, as new immigrants are, where you could get sued. Um, not only that, forget about lawsuits. There are plenty of situations where a new immigrant could get hurt, injured, volunteer staff member get hurt, injured, where a, a client could ask more of the volunteer, you know, take me to the bank, open a new bank account. Well, that's not the volunteer's role. Next thing that the volunteer knows is that they're going with them to the bank and, and they're getting phone calls at home on the weekends and it gets a little bit too much. Here's a question that's come in. What happens when staff become friends and socialize with clients or volunteers? Is there any liability in this case? So what happens when staff become friends and socialize with clients or volunteers? Is there any liability in this case? Well, again, I need to know more detail. So please come next week and bring this question with more detail, and I'd love to actually answer it with the context. But let me just go into it from what I think you're asking. You're saying, let's say a staff member on the weekend uh, um, decides to, to, to go out and go to the movies, uh, the staff member's family becomes friends with the other family because they share the same religion or they share some commonalities and become very good friends. First of all, that's going to happen. Uh, I think what we want to do is train staff and volunteers that, um, that they want to be careful in these situations um, because there's all, there are things that could go wrong. Um, if it's a situation where you just want to make a policy on this, I know some organizations have, and they said, look, outside of the program, we do not want, we'd like you to really try to, to stay away from doing that. Um, for instance, if you're working in a situation where they're going to know confidential information, uh, and very likely that's the case, um, you now have a situation where uh, it becomes more difficult, right? Um, so I think you have to look at situations one by one, but I would tell your volunteers and staff members, especially staff members, we want you to take extra precaution. Look at your past history. Has anything gone wrong? So always start by looking at the data in the past. Um, 
when we get together next week, bring that question. I'm going to ask people on the line whether or not they've had anything go wrong. Um, just let me just ask the question. If you just pull that aside for a second, um, so I can see the hands being raised. If you can just um, okay. How many of you, by raise a hand, uh, raise your hands if you've had something go wrong where staff have become close to clients outside of program time and something's gone wrong? Put up your hand. So one person. Um, now two, three. So I'm asking, how many of you have had something where staff have become friends with clients outside of work time and something's gone wrong? So three of you put up your hands. So I, what I'd like you to do is, if you're willing to type the situation in now, that's great, and then we'll talk about it right now. Or you can bring it next week and we'll get into more detail. But the bottom line is, absolutely things can go wrong. I know there's organizations where they've told their uh, staff they're not to have relationships with people outside of outside of the programs. Now, that's tough. Um, so I don't think that that's a policy you can put in place many times. What I do on my own time, frankly, is my own business. If I become friends with a client, how is that your business? Um, we become good friends. But there are situations where I know, let's take victim services. Victim services, they are coming to a situation where someone's being murdered. There's all kinds of incredible scenarios. Like, so they make a policy. We don't want you befriending or having friendships with people outside of time. Uh, they even make it policy clear that if you were to meet somebody outside of uh, Tim Hortons, that unless they approach you, you're not to talk to them. Because they don't want, victims don't want somebody coming up to them uh, and the Tim Hortons is saying, hey, how's it going? Uh, I remember I was the guy there when uh, last month and um, th that helped you after your husband got murdered. Well, we're in a coffee shop. What are you talking about? So um, you have to be very careful. So what I was going to, what I would say is, make sure staff know what your policy is if you have one. Train it carefully, um, and it's really a one by one scenario. Here's another uh, thing that's come up: Sa uh, staff ended up renting an apartment to a client, and though nothing went wrong, it seemed like a conflict of interest. It just seemed wrong to me. Absolutely. Um, so you have a staff member that's maybe got a basement apartment and now they're renting out the basement apartment to a client. That is a conflict of interest. So what I might do in that case is certainly you should have a conflict of interest policy. That we, that we don't need to think twice about that. S staff members, um, uh, board members need to understand that conflict of interest means that you benefit um, from your client relationship, especially financially. You know, you've got a, a situation where you cut grass, and now you find out that all the all your clients are getting their their grass cut by one particular staff member. That's that's a really conflict of interest. So, we want to have a conflict of interest policy. We want to make it clear. If you have a basement apartment, um, you cannot be going around telling people I've got basement apartment um, and try to rent it out to it. So yes, I do think. Now, if you didn't have that conflict of interest policy in place, then they didn't do anything wrong. Uh, if you didn't put it in place and train them, they didn't know they did anything wrong. Maybe they were just trying to help. Maybe they gave them even a better rate. But there's even bigger issues here um, that we can get into next week when we get into the details. Here's another one. We're thinking to have social enterprise by hiring some of our clients who want to do some catering business part-time. And we have to pay them through our program in order to support their recovery. As a nonprofit charitable business, we're really worrying about the liability of including hiring them and defining our relationship with them as employer and employee, what would be your advice? Well, I'll tell you what. Will you come next week? Because I've got eight minutes left uh, today. Would you come next week to our round table uh, and bring that question? Because honestly, that, qu that question, I need to spend some time with you and go back and forth in terms of the details. Let me just say this. There are some problems with doing that. Um, you would have to define it very carefully. A. B. I also think you could do it. It just has to be done carefully. So please come next week. If you can't come next week, then um, uh, give me the, the context of it in an email, and me and you can go back and forth in the email. Last time, uh, I, I, I did do some personal kind of um, uh, consulting, and by all means, email me questions. We can do it on the side. But I'd love if you brought that next week, and we could actually openly talk, um, because that's a very, very good question. OK, let me just go on to I've got to talk now about doing a risk map. So let me just hold on the questions for a second. There's a lot of things in this PowerPoint, but I want to go into this issue of how do you actually create a risk map, and I just want to quickly talk about that. So a risk map is, just to quickly show you on the slide, here's what a, one example of risk map is. Risk map is looking at all the bad things that could happen in our organization, and we look at it in terms of what's its likelihood, 
So likelihood means what's the chance it could happen? Slip and fall. So somebody slipping and falling at one of our programs is almost guaranteed to be your highest risk that could happen. And if you've got seniors, seniors slipping and falling, what would the impact be? Insignificant, minor, moderate, major, extreme? Well, probably at least moderate because they're seniors. If you slip and fall on your senior, you've got a hip replacement, you've got a knee replacement, big issues. If they're young people that are healthy, um, adults that are healthy, they're not, you know, they're, their limbs are in good shape, it's probably minor insignificant. So it would be a yellow risk for you, the, uh, slip and fall. Almost certain to happen, but insignificant or minor. I'm not going to spend a lot of time focusing on that. What I want to focus my attention is, is on the orange and the red. Risks that are almost certain or likely or major, moderate, or extreme impact. It means they can really hurt our reputation. Somebody could be really hurt. If I work with a youth serving organization, uh, uh, um, the risk of allegation of child molestation would be in my red and orange area. Until I determine that I've done so much work like Big Brothers Big Sisters have, that it no longer falls in the almost certain or likely. It just falls impossible. So it's no longer a red risk. So what I'd like you to do is every two years create one of these. The question is, how do you do it? Well, let me go up here and walk you through. So we're going to first off start with a laundry list. How are we going to do that? Well, I've got to create a task force. I'm not into creating a, man, a, uh, a committee. My personal opinion is I want to create as few committees in my organization as possible. I'm going to offend some people right, right now, but I believe that most committees have become just places that people go and die. It's not places where people actually have great ideas, where they come with energy. I'd like to use the term task force. I'd like to use an example. We're going to put together a group of people. We're going to meet every two or three weeks for a few hours, and we're going to meet for three months. That's a task force. Here's a task, one or two things you're going to do. You're going to meet a couple, every couple of weeks for, let's say, three hours, and we're going to have one or two things we got to do. At the end of the 90 days, we've done it, we walk away. You can attract better people. I can tell you me, I will not submit, I will not sit on any more committees for the rest of my life as a promise. I will sit on task force, and I do all the time. But if someone asks me, and I get asked all the time to sit on committees, my answer is always the same. Is it something that I'm going to come on? There's no, there's no specific task, and the time frame is we have no idea what's going to end? No, I'm not ever sitting on that. There are people we need for committees. There's board committees, and we get to governance. There are board committees you need to have. Wonderful. I'm grateful for those people that are willing to do it. Me personally, I'm too busy. I've got kids. I'm willing to sit on task force. So we're going to do something for three months. I know it's going to be over. I know everybody's going to throw their energy at it. Great. I want to pick a diverse group with skills, experience, personality. First, we're going to do as a group is we've been tasked with creating their risk map. We're going to create a laundry list. So we're going to go through. I've given you the questions here. And we're going to try to figure out what could go wrong. I've listed the questions for you here. I think you can walk through them and see how it's uh, quite easy to do this. And we're going to take, remember, we're doing this over 90 days. We're meeting every two weeks for a couple hours. We're going to look at all the different types of things that could go wrong. We're going to ask the questions. And, and uh, you'll see this written out in the documents that Petra sent you earlier. We're going to look at all kinds of things, including what other organizations we depend on. Look at here, the ties that bind. We're going to look at potential crisis risks that could severely damage our reputation, make it extremely difficult to deliver our services. What type of allegations could wind up as headlines in the newspaper in your community? We're going to think about all these things. You know, um, do the programs you do or a client population you serve um, sh uh, suggest a source of crisis? Where are your programs you've read? Are they in a difficult part of town? Where you're, where you're located? Is it crime-ridden? Are there, are there people around that could, you know, what kind of risks come just from where we are? And in terms of what you do, do you rely heavily on the internet or van transportation? We're gonna, you know, there's a million car accidents in Canada every year. So if we have a lot of transportation, we're going to look at that as a risk. Do we have just one key funder? The risk is that we lose our funding. So I've listed a ton of questions in here. So then we've got, let's say we've We've spent a couple months. We've met every two or three hours. We've then polled our staff and volunteers to make sure we've got a good list. We've then got to put them up on this list. Well, how do you do that? I'm going to suggest something very, very basic, and I think you're going to love this. Have any of you had a garage sale? Put up your hands if you've had a garage sale or been to a garage sale in the last year. Put up your, up your hand if you've been to a garage sale or, or had a garage sale in the last year. Okay, so most of you. At a garage sale, usually people put stickers on the items, 50 cents, 25 cents, $2. Go to Staples and get those stickers, and they start $2, $1, 50 cent, because I'm just being cool there, 50 cent, uh, 25 cent, and 
So you got, and everybody in your group, in your task force, or God forbid you call a committee, and you're doing anything, give each of them a $2 sticker, a $1 sticker, 75, 50 cent, 25 cent, everybody's got those five stickers. So they have to vote. Of all these risks we've come up with, what do they consider to be their $2 risk? In other words, the most important risk, the highest likelihood of having a real impact on your organization, and everybody votes. So let's say we have a group of 12 that we put together. So 12 people have a $2 sticker, $1 sticker, 75 cent, here it comes, 50 cent, and a 25 cent, and they all vote. The risk that has the most money attached to it at the end, that becomes your top risk. You bring that back to your board every two years, and you say, look, we've determined as a risk committee or as a risk task force, hope you don't use the word committee, we've been together for 90 days, we've come up with a list. Here they are, top 10, and the board can ask you questions how you came up with it. It would be the board's determination then to map out over the next couple of years when they're going to get to fixing these risks. And that's what you want to do. You want to make a timetable. In case a court case ever happens, you do not want to be able to say, you don't want to be able, you want to say that, oh yeah, we knew there was a, these risks around, but we didn't have time to get to it. And by the way, we're talking about major risks. You might end up having two or three. You might end up having 13. You might end up having one. We're talking about major risks, critical risks, and the things that are in this kind of red, orange level areas. Okay? So you do that every two years, you map it out, then you filter your risk through these questions. And we'll talk more uh, next week when I'm going to carry on and we're going to get to the detailed questions that you're going to bring. Um, I'll finish off these slides then, but they're all here about communicating. In summary, as I end, protecting people has to be priority one. Not stopping a lawsuit. And you know, when you're talking to your people and you're building risk management, really it's just good management. You need to communicate it as not risk management, but as we want to protect you. If you want to have your best staff stay, you want your best volunteers to stay, help them to know that above creating amazing programs for your clients and new immigrants, you want to make sure that everything that you ever do is protecting them that your priority is not protecting clients, although you definitely want to do that. You want their help to make sure that you do that. You want to make sure that they're protected. I'll tell you what, in a survey, this is now a few years old, the number one thing that volunteers looked at was how are you protecting me, which is an amazing thing. And many times volunteers leave because they truly don't feel safe. Number two, don't create policy without involving your own people who currently do the work. Before I ever create a policy, I want to make sure that the people that are doing the work, the volunteers and staff, they impact what's in that policy. You don't want people, we don't want the policy coming out and going, oh great. Another thing, as a volunteer, wow, I had to go through screening, now I've got all these policies. One more thing to make me not want to come, or staff who are just feeling overburdened as it is. Staff need to know that every policy that relates to them, significant policy that relates to them, actually went through a staff group, a staff task force. Love it. Put it in writing. Every significant risk needs to have a policy in writing. No more than one page. Make it simple, concise, right? Also make it kind. Start every policy with, we appreciate that you're a staff member, a volunteer with us. That's make it kind. That really energizes staff and volunteers. Document retention, I'll get this into more uh, detail as we go forward, but um, you know, any key documents, put it in their file, staff file, volunteer file, don't throw it out unless it, you can prove one thing, and that is that they never dealt one-on-one -on -one with clients. They've always had supervision. So I know with um, Sudbury District Health, I work with District Health on occasion, they've determined that if any role that they have for a volunteer staff member, uh, if they ever work one-on-one -on -one with a client, they're going to keep their staff file, their volunteer file forever. And if they don't work one-on-one, -on -one, if they never work one-on-one, -on -one, they're only going to keep the file three to five years after they leave. Always keep your insurance paperwork. Number seven. Most nonprofits I meet have got tons of areas of risk that they need to be working on. So please don't feel overburdened as you leave now. Please think, okay, you know what? We could do this. Every two years, create a risk map, put together a group of people, start creating policy that are the most important risk. We can do this. Start slow. If you've already got lots of policies, focus on slimming down your paperwork. Number eight, strong risk management requires transparency, dialogue. Your staff volunteers need to know that their opinion matters, right? If you've got a belly acre, who just belly aches about everything, well, we have to make sure that they are, there's boundary, boundaries around that, right? 
So um, when somebody comes and they're saying the same problem and you've already looked at it, you need to tell them, look, I hear what you're saying. I've looked into it. Uh, I disagree with you. I don't see the same problem you do. I do respect your perspective. Number nine, celebrate along the way. As you do things, tell volunteers and staff what you're up to. Thank the volunteers and staff that were involved. Say, look, here, we got this great policy. It was determined by our staff, for our staff. I just want to thank everybody involved. It could be an email. You know, sometimes I work with all kinds of nonprofits that don't have money for big doodahs or parties. But what you can do is at least send an email saying, we want to thank Mary and Tom because on their own time, this is what they did. Very, very important. So my final thought today is take risks intentionally, right? So many organizations have their head in the sand. How can you know what risks you have unless you spend time? I'm suggesting every two years create that risk map. You can't manage risk properly when you don't even know what they are. So my suggestion to you is in the next 90 days, could you create a risk map or start the possibility? Or you could create a boundary form or, or for risky positions. We'll be talking about that next, next uh, in the weeks to come, what a boundary form is. So that every organization can start somewhere. Let me give you one to start with, the number one thing. Does, do all your volunteers and staff members have an emergency contact list? In the next 90 days, could you get that list out to all your staff members, if you've got volunteers, to all your volunteers, an emergency contact list? How critical is that? Well, thank you for today. Could you uh, let us know? We would be grateful if uh, you let us know. We're going to be sending out an evaluation. Is there an evaluation coming out for this? If not, there's no evaluation. Oh, there is an evaluation. Next week. Evaluation is coming out next week. But I would be grateful if you let us know how it's going. If today you appreciated today's webinar, can you put your hand up and let us know? Here comes, oh, there's hands coming. That's awesome. I, I, that's very important. And, you know, next week, come with your questions. If you've got questions in between, my email is davidandrewhartley at gmail.com. Please let us know, um, you know, how we're doing and if we can get any better. I hope you're going to stay with us for the whole five webinars. Thank you so much for coming today.